know, if you love something enough, you'll find a way to do it, no matter what the consequences are, or what it costs you. It's something that just doesn't happen overnight. I spend a lot of time trying to get to where I'm at. Nobody told me how to do it, and there's no book out there you can buy to read about it. And that's how people get in these situations, taking chances. Characteristics that really make him a master of this sport, you know, of free falling downhill in, in a semi controlled manner. Yeah, I think mainly his style on the snow is just super, super smooth. He has a lot of composure and he's really, really graceful but yet aggressive and definitely one of the like best skiers I've ever seen. watching uh, some of the movies and uh, magazines and stuff, you know, everything portrayed Seth as a totally wild character. I think the first time I met him in uh, the course of an hour, he probably only said four or five words. He was very intimidating because he was so quiet and because of his image. It's crazy, man, like his skiing, it totally intertwines with his personality, you know. We'll be standing on a peak and won't hardly say anything, and all of a sudden he goes and launches a 120-foot backflip. There's been so many different generations and so much progression and so much change. I can't really think of any others that's been around for that long that are still on top. He started in 93, I was born in 92. So I mean, I was one when Seth got started and 20 years later, he's still one of the biggest names in the sport. Years down the road after you start doing something you love, it's not going to be the same. I just didn't think about making a living out of it. It's given me the opportunity to do a lot of cool things and see a lot of cool places and meet a lot of cool people. But it was a lot more fun when it was a lot more of a simple life. There is kind of a, a funny irony to this business. I mean, I love to ski and you know, this is what I do and what I enjoy doing. It's my passion. It's, uh, it's really everything to me. But now, you know, you can't just go out and uh, do everything for fun. Back in the beginning, you're getting free pairs of skis and a couple paychecks. It's pretty mellow. You're living an easy life. Oh, all of a sudden, you get a little bit older. You start, you know, you do better and better. You're still in the game. Boom. Now it's a job. Any professional athlete or, or a movie star or, or a singer or anyone who's in the limelight, you've got to give so much of your time up to be in the, the public's eyes. A, a lot of people, it actually burns them out. There are a lot of sacrifices that sometimes have to be made. You know, relationships suffer. Your mental stability suffers uh, sometimes. You constantly have to be trying to perform better, do as much work as you possibly can promotion-wise. 
Otherwise, somebody else is going to take your job. For any athlete in any sport, that as you get older, you start becoming concerned about younger athletes coming in that are as talented as you, if not more talented. When anything in life gets stagnant and boring, people don't want to see that anymore. They want to see something new. And it's just like any other job where there's competition, and there always will be. So you got to reinvent yourself. You have to constantly bring new things to the table, and skiing allows that because it's such a dynamic sport. Doing what you love is absolutely amazing, but at the same time, it's frustrating and it's aggravating, and you know, there's joyous moments and moments of elation, and, and there's so many different emotions that come into play when you're dealing with something that you love. You could ask a professional skier, you know, if they could do it all over again, I, I bet you half of them might just be like, you know what, I'd rather just be a ski bum. Forget about all the money and just go skiing and just, just, just have fun. Started, it was purely about skiing, like every shot that was shot was used. Now it's about the greatest line, the biggest air. If, if you're not going to die on each run, then it's not going to get used in the movie. It's just a, sort of a, a stuntman show that people want to see. First time I went skiing was on a sledding hill in Des Plaines, Illinois. I'd been watching the Olympics and I was watching downhill racing and that got me pretty excited about skiing. I'd never seen it before. And just uh, being able to stand up on something and fly down the mountain looked like a cool idea. They had some little red plastic skis in the crawl space with aluminum poles. And pretty much you just strap your feet right onto the skis. There was no bindings or anything. It was just a little strap set up. I didn't really have uh, any idea of it being any better. It was what it was, and you didn't care. You didn't care how cold it was. You didn't care if it was icy. You're not spoiled on powder skiing. You're not spoiled at being some big resort. You just wanted to keep going and doing laps and just exploring. When I was six, my parents got divorced. My father you know, pretty much split. We never really saw him ever again. I'm sure it was really difficult for both my kids, uh, Seth particularly, because he was the one who knew his biological father the, the most. We didn't have any contact with our father after the separation, so it was pretty much my mom and my brother and I. Then we moved out to Colorado when I was 10 years old after living in Wisconsin for four years. Just being in Vail is pretty expensive as it is. Just, you know, you see a lot of she-she places around. The rent probably doubled to move out here. It was tough just to be able to get gear, really. So a lot of times we're getting used gear at the, the ski swap that they do at the beginning of the season. You know, you just trade off. You go without some things so that you can make other things happen. His father never once called, never once sent a, sent a postcard or a Christmas card or a Christmas present. Zero contact, nothing. 
not growing up with the dad was, you know, I, I wouldn't know what it was like any other way. He was always hesitant to talk about it. He just said, I don't care. He did, but he would never admit it. My mom was always having to work, so I had to kind of have to fend for myself. I had to fill up my time, and skiing was that rather than sitting in front of the TV. He really could have gone in any direction when our parents separated, but he chose to put it into skiing. We'd find a way to get to the mountain and find a way to get back, whether it was taking the bus or getting a ride with somebody else's parents. The best part about it was just uh, having all this terrain to ski around. As a young child, you were uh, on a full adventure every time you went skiing. You know, there'd be 200 boys skiing, and he would always be in the top 20, and sometimes he was in the top 10. He was pretty good as a ski racer. I guess I did fairly well. I wasn't like winning anything, but once high school rolled around, I was getting out numerous days a week, half day of school every day. Some of the teachers would say that he's not going to be a skier when he grows up. He needs to have a job. Maybe he wasn't going to be a big time Olympic skier, but it gave him self-confidence. It gave him something that a lot of kids never see. And I wasn't hanging out with all the other kids at my school that were partying on the weekends and drinking, smoking weed. I was focused on ski, and that's all I wanted to do. He became more and more and more intense and more focused, and if he had something to prove, he was proving it, and he wanted to do it as well as he could. Well, the level of racing that I was at is basically what takes you into being on the U.S. ski team. It was the go, 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 win, win, win environment. Whatever you were doing, you weren't trying hard enough. And he even had some ski coaches telling you you should quit and go do something else. But for me, it was just I wanted to be out there skiing every day, and I didn't care what these guys said. Sometimes I would be out inspecting the course, and as soon as I was out of sight, I was zipping off to chairlift to go ski around on the mountain. One of my coaches got caught wind of that, and he basically told me that if he ever found out that I was out there, I was going to get you know, cut. You know, that I wasn't going to make it on a U.S. ski team. It was just something about him that he had this air about him, and you knew he was there, and you knew he had the skill and the talent, and you were just wondering what was next, what was, what was in store for this kid. I had always hoped that the skiing would get him a college scholarship. Well, that's not where it went. Going into the freshman year of college, I still didn't really know what I was going to be doing. So I was kind of using school as a way to be a ski bum. He was supposed to get a job and work part time to try and contribute toward that, which he didn't do. So I think he was pretty much starving and just skiing. Being away from the house, you know, you're kind of rebelling, I guess, doing whatever you want. And I had a couple of punk rocker friends that turned me on to the colored hair, you know, got me my first color, which was purple. And I just kind of stuck. When it came time for the Crested Butte Extremes, Nobody knew who I was. Nobody had any idea how I could ski. When we were free skiing a lot, like you could do anything and make anything happen. And that's kind of what doing that extreme event was like. Within the three or four days of doing that contest, it pretty much changed the course of my life because I tied for second, sort of the dark horse. And after that, it was boom, filming it for Warren Miller. It was cool to be getting that attention at the age of 19. Kind of the first time where everything worked out for me, I guess. It was so hard to comprehend that Seth would be doing something that was that dangerous. I see ski accidents all the time. That's where I'm coming from. It's my job. I'm taking care of people who've really hurt themselves badly skiing. I mean, what can you do? Because I couldn't stop him. It was like, drink red wine and go get some psychotherapy. And that's the truth. I mean, I, I, was, I was terrified for him. routine, the day in, day out. It's kind of like a nine to five job in a sense. 
That's why you want to search for new things to do all the time in, in this line of work. It's definitely nerve-wracking coming here. I've heard about all the natural hazards, rock fall, rock fall, avalanches, falling into crevasses. Being scared and not knowing. That makes you feel alive again. Chamonix is a mountain town uh, located on the Swiss, French, uh, Italian border, right below the Mont Blanc Massif, which is basically the summit of continental Europe. It's the highest peak in the Alps. The mountains doesn't get bigger than this anywhere else in the world. They might be at a higher altitude, but they don't get really bigger. Uh, and we have lifts getting you up to them. They have all the infrastructure, all the resources. They got the rescue, they got the trams, they got so many people practicing the sport that you can talk to and learn from. Right when I stepped into the air in town, you can feel like the, the instant vibe of everything that's happened here. This is where steep skiing began, ski alpinism, mountaineering, all that stuff has started right here in this valley. And you end up with like this massive mountain community here, and that's like one of the most important resources you can have when you're trying to learn something. Here we go, and here we go. That's our guide, Nate Wallace. Oh. He's Nate, there's nothing like it. There's no other American that lives in Sham that's as shamified as he is. You know, the skiers I, are I happy, the snowboarders, go. and then look, the, the, the people come here on holiday, look, they're just blown away. Nate, I met him like that, from the day and night, and he told me about Crazy Nate. I said, OK, machin, and tout. And in fact, it's true that Nate has a temperament like all the Americans. À charger, à charger, et que par contre il a un respect, c'est vrai, pour l'historique et l'histoire de Cham surtout. That's the first time I met Nate. He's been showing us around the mountain. Not necessarily a guide, but more of a mountain freak, I'd say. Lock and load, send the kid in. <laughs> so a good guy to be with here in the mountains. He knows this place like the back of his hand. And on this trip, I mean, we're here to ski and have a good time and good skiing. And that's the, you know, that's the bottom line. I knew all about Seth, but I never met him. You'd expect with all the flamboyant skiing he does and the crazy stunts that he pulls that he'd be kind of aggressive, aggro, and ah, I'm gonna kill it. And, and no. Even entry level Chamonix skiing, you could kill yourself here. And nobody telling you, you can't go over the edge. And, people just all over the place doing different things. It's pretty crazy. The amount of fatalities in this valley is, is, is super high compared to any other normal ski area. And the Serac Falls, Bergstrunds, the crevasses, every single day, every time you ski, you're skiing under something, over something that's out of your control. Even if you do everything right, even if you're the best in the world, there is still a risk that the mountain will uh, hit you bad and you can't do anything about it. Take it one step at a time and work our way into it. You can't just go up to the biggest thing and drop right in. That's, that's just stupid. You gotta learn. And here I am learning. Yeah, well, you know, when Seth and uh, Kai and JP showed up, despite being some of the best skiers in the world, there was no way I was going to feed them to the wolves right away and be like, oh yeah, let's, you know, we'll just go rock into the biggest, heaviest run and rip it up. Anytime you get into mountains where there's so many objective risks, skiing is really no longer, you know, enough. You know, it really helps to be a great skier, but that won't take you very far. Skiing is only one third of the whole picture, and the rest of it's climbing and uh, just basically getting through the mountains and surviving. The guys gotta know their stuff. They gotta know what they're doing with their ropes. They gotta know their ice axes and crampons. I mean, they gotta know what they're getting into. Oh, well, we're just here at Sergeant Tierra Basin at a, a climbing area called the Cremery. And we're all out here in our ski boots and our ski clothes, and we're just kinda using the equipment and make sure we got it all dialed. It's just gonna be good practice for what we might encounter when we're alpine skiing. So like a figure eight, or like if you can't even remember that, if you're ever like, if shit's hitting the fan or if you need to clip in, you know, you just grab the rope. This isn't just an overhand, just like this. Ice climbing is a really integral part to this type of skiing we do here in Chamonix. And if you're out there trying to ski these big couloirs, big faces, or intricate lines, 
there's a good chance that it's not always going to be just snow. You're going to have some ice in between. Here, do you want a daisy chain? You got one of those? You know how that works? You're going to put that through, loop that through quickly. These guys did really, really well today. They flew up the climbs. You know, it's just nice to get back on some ice. For me, it's probably been over 10 years or something. And we just had a really good day. I mean, we got to work out a little bit. Yeah, it was pretty fun. I'm glad we got to do that. The unique thing about Chamonix in particular is just the history behind it. It wasn't designed to be a ski area. It was designed to get people up to the mountains, enjoy the scenery. They've gone out of their way to make the mountains accessible. Granite, the Aguita Midi is a little bit out there as far as making the mountains accessible. How's it going? Damn, you look like you're ready for the Midi. <laughs> If the Guida wasn't here, this place wouldn't be as special. The access this lift gives you to the mountains is unparalleled. 9,200 vertical feet, takes you from a little over 3,000 to over 12,000 feet. It puts you into the mountains, like, like real deep, high mountains in a half an hour. It's amazing. I mean, it's absolutely amazing piece of machinery that we get to use all the time. I mean, there's nothing like it anywhere in the world. I mean, look at this, this building. It's like just you know, stuck right into the rock. I mean, it's insane. This is like the quickest, easiest access to the gnarliest terrain. With no runs, no slope, no ropes, and people are basically like left to make their own decisions on their way down the mountain. I think that's the best thing about this country is that it's rock and roll. As long as you don't hurt other people, you can do whatever you like. I decided to come up and just do a little easy climb called the Cosmic Arete. We're basically going to climb up this arete here. And uh, in the distance, you can kind of see the top station of the Guida Medina. We'll, we'll end up there. You need to have confidence in the guy that's got you on the line. You can see the way that he works when we're, we're on the ropes and stuff and setting up anchors that he knows what's going on, and that helps. I feel that Nate doesn't take any bullshit, and I kind of like that. If he feels like he got good respect, then he's going to be more than happy to show you his place. They're going to be here. The rope is going to be yeah. right here. I think it's a good idea then. But it might be hitting here. You might be hitting the rope. With, you'll be hitting your rope with that. When you get to the top of the Guida Midi, you look down into this an abyss of rock and uh, a couloir that leads out, but you have no idea where it goes. The Passerelle couloir is very impressive to look at when you're on that bridge. Pretty much a, a V crack that you're going down, and there's no escape if anything goes wrong. It's a big step into doing bigger things. A, we didn't have to climb it and B, it required a lot of rope work. You're literally walking out the doors, you set your ropes and you start propelling in. No one feels comfortable. I've done it many times for climbs and I, I still get nervous. I've never done any kind of rappels like that before where you rappel down to another rappel and you're free hanging right away. Yeah, <laughs> couldn't really see much. You know? I was trying to look around. We had a bit of an idea what the snow was like. We looked in there and uh, we were able to do two full length propels. And then you got a down climb through a little technical section of snow and rock. The beers will taste good tonight. You had fear, you had joy, excitement, relief all melded into one. It's one of those experiences that I haven't felt in a long, long time. That was pretty cool to see his face and a different expression than I've ever seen it before. Yeah, it was sweet. I'm glad we did that. Everybody had a smile on their face. He was shamified for sure after that run. Doing this kind of sport hasn't ever been really about the money. It's more about the fun of it, scaring yourself and challenging yourself. It's just trying to find out who you are and what you're capable of doing. If you're going to make this uh, decision to embark on this kind of journey or occupation like this as a as an artist or a musician or you know this sort of whole free skiing concept of your you know it's, it's a completely unknown road where your only guidance is your passion for doing it 
Bernard, guys, come on out. Okay, just hang them back up there. Great. I'm in a very similar situation as Seth. I mean, we don't come for much, and me and Callum, we had a single mom all growing up, and when we moved to Whistler, yeah, she was. We were just getting by. You know, we were living in a basement suite. We were, we were all three of us sharing a room. It was me, my brother, and my mom living in Whistler, and my dad living on the complete other side of the country. It's tough for every kid not to have not to have their dad around at all, but we found the way to substitute that with the mountain. It's that was our our father figure, I guess you could say. It was almost this place for us to go where we didn't have to think about anything else. There was no problems on the mountain. It was all about fun and we thrived to just ski with our friends and learn from each other. That was the best part. It was not having anyone tell you what to do. And for you to be able to go out there and do your thing with your friends was the greatest thing in the world. Our style of skiing is very different than a lot of other types of skiing or any sport in general where you're dealing with a competitive atmosphere. Back in that era from like the mid 80s to mid 90s, it was like kind of a transition time where the different uh, bodies governing the sport, they were not catering to these people who were into doing stuff more freely. People that wanted to be on their own, they wanted to be doing their own thing whatever that was. The people that, uh, you know, that ran the sponsorship for companies, they were, they were still the guys that used to do the race programs. And, uh, you know, those guys, the only way they could understand skiing and, and as, a, as a job, they figured it needed to be competition-based and there had to be a winner. And it's super subjective, you know, when you have, you know, sort of mainstream sports and you have champions and it's super regimented and this is sort of all over the map. It's a lifestyle and an art form more than uh, more than it is an actual sport. I think we're actually uh, going out there and trying to be part of the mountains, and uh, and by skiing and leaving our tracks down, and it's uh, you know it's part of uh, us painting on a canvas of nature. Free skiing was like the wild, wild west, man. It was totally new. There was no rules. There was no career path. There was no one telling you, this is what you gotta do. It was a complete leap of faith with really no guarantee of any return. It was really tough in the early years to have these companies take you seriously, especially myself, because I was 19 years old when I started doing this. It was just hard to, to try to get your foot in the door and convince these guys that this is what was new and what was happening, uh, you're pretty much laughed at. Like some of the sponsors would just think it was a joke what you were doing. I had a marketing manager one time that came from selling sailboats, and what did she know about skiing? And she was trying to tell me how it was. Doing photo shoots, you were more of a, a model. You weren't really a, a ski athlete. You would be wearing their clothing, and they'd have you all right, make a turn around this little tree or stand over here, jump off of that. It was uh, a country club kind of, kind of a sport, uh, pretty much for the elite. You started noticing these companies using your image, asking you to do things for them. You're starting to get photos in the magazines and they're starting to promote their products, but they're not giving you anything in return except for the, for the free gear and you're having to work all summer to pay off your winner or save up for the next winner. Uh, even one of the sponsors I had at the time, they thought it was so funny that I was working at Taco Bell. It's just like, well, that's what I gotta do. You guys don't pay me. It came to the point where I was just gonna walk away from trying to do the pro skier thing because it wasn't, it wasn't really what I 
thought it was going to be at the end. You don't know what the future holds, like maybe you're not playing the poker hand right, but at that point it's a decision of should I continue trying to be this or uh, find something else to do. I was kind of surprised that my first couple days skiing here, I actually have never skied snow that bad before, ever. It's officially the uh, second worst winter in the history of France. We've been just skiing pretty much the, the gnarliest snow I've ever filmed in as far as you know, inconsistent, um, hard pack, you know, sastrugi, uh, very little corn, you know, maybe when you get down low. But, uh, you know, after a couple days out there in the field with these guys, no one's complaining. Everyone's coming home all smiling. We're having great days. And pretty much having the best filming that we've had on the trip. intimidated than I thought at first and then I felt more comfortable than I would have expected right after. I'm absolutely loving this slow pace. You go up and it's one step at a time and you go down and it's the same pace, you know, and for me that's very comforting. It's a totally different style of skiing for me that I didn't even think I could discover at, you know, 33. Yeah! That's the move, buddy. Nate's already at the bottom, almost ready to show up. No one can come here and be a rock star. Everybody's one with the mountains. Everyone's a, a little ant on a, on a fucking sidewalk, you know what I'm saying? I hear Kai, he's trying to come down you know, to the lot. He's, kind of, he's, you know, he's half Canadian, and half like prehistoric, like dinosaur raptor. You're like, <sighs> he just attacks it, you know? You're in the raddest place on earth doing doing what you want to be doing, and I don't think there's any other level of ecstasy you can be on. <laughs> the boys love it. We love it. You, you come here and you're content because you know it's the, the finale of, of what you want to be doing if you're, if you're a mountain lover, you know. Three, two, one, drop it. You don't need to feel like you're doing this awesome thing that's never been done before. You're just uh, doing something that you've never done before. Still alive.
I came to Chamonix in uh, December of uh, 1998. You know, I had W. Gaston's book on uh, 100 classics for like four years. I had like every peak and line just memorized. And it was a tough first year. We got buried in a big avalanche in a town, killed a bunch of people. Later in that year, lost another friend. But uh, despite it all, I just couldn't leave this place. It was just too amazing. I guess people call him crazy, but it's, you kind of got to be, you know, got to have a few screws loose to be skiing around here and climbing around here. It's, it's not a, a normal ski place. It's not a ski area. It's not a, necessarily a ski resort. Um, he's really knowledgeable at what he's doing, and I think people just, uh, you know, they don't really see him out there. They just hear the stories of what his, his day entailed and they see him in the bar celebrating, but that's kind of part of, of your experience here. When you come down at the end of the day and you did something really gnarly, it's like you got hit by a lightning bolt and you're pretty energized and excited and you're just letting loose, having a good time. When I came here the first day, I was shamified to the max. And you see people like Nate that live here, and they're, they're wild characters they are. They're all shamified, right? So that's what we call it. There's so many peaks that I would have in speed. I think sham enlightened my uh, vision of trying to spend the rest of my life skiing, but I think it was always there. See, it's JP Open Air. I come from Quebec City, I'm a freestyle kid. That's my background. That's how I made a career out of it. And that's how I got all my opportunities. The more I would travel and the more I would see the mountains, the more I'd be drawn away from the park and more towards the mountains. I never really stopped to think about my goals and stuff, but I constantly had new interests and appetite for uh, exploration and discovery and I think it's awesome it led me here so far. Is that the top of the Cristo, the flat one? No. no the <laughs> and then there goes the Le Court, the Dwat, and the Vert. The Vert is the tallest? Yeah. Yeah. Come on, get brave. You got it in you. Man's been migrating for years and years and years and and uh, I think this, you know, we're still migrating. Maybe we're just migrating from here to there, to that ridge, to that couloir, I don't know, but we're still just traveling around, exploring things. I mean, pretty much generally human nature to do that. Where are you going today? Eh, Valerie, huh? Not so bad. No. Yeah. Soft, tranquil. Okay. That's good training. Training? Yeah. Yeah? Training for what? Training? For montagne? Yeah, okay. And in plus, the evolution of the piste, it's not in two years that you become good, it's all your life. And even at the end of your life, you can't even say that you're good. You always have to learn, always, always. So, yeah, that's it. not the same old thing every day here. Sure, so lots of people have done a lot of these lines, but it's pretty set up to do all that. There's bolts everywhere for rappels, and um, it's just having the knowledge of how to use ropes and, and do all that stuff to, to ski around here. And there's nobody telling you no. The only boundaries are your, your mind. There was a point 
for sure where it just kind of seemed like you were doing the same thing over and over again. And you didn't really know that anything was going to change. Just kind of started getting the, the feeling of that I was just being used all the time for what we were doing. After a while, it's like, you know, this, I want to ski, but I've got to make money to keep doing this. There was a few of us at the time that kind of stuck together and put our foot down, and you didn't know what was going to come of it because nobody that you were involved with was making any money either. I was almost completely over what I was doing, and boom, got the payday that I was looking for. I was like, all right, goodbye, shithead job. Uh, I'm going on a film trip. That's where things just went out of control. Well, I thought I was borrowing it, but then it, it turns out you're technically stealing the car. Uh, I had full intent of bringing it back. Well, they got drunk and took the car out of the guy's garage and went doing donuts in the cul-de-sac, and they rammed it into four cars. And they started questioning people, and eventually I just turned myself in because uh, the people that they were bothering had nothing to do with it. So that didn't really turn out all that great for me. <laughs> it was finally started making money and had to give it all away for being stupid. Basically everything I made and then some went to uh, paying for the mistake. I had to go do some jail time for a couple weeks. It didn't really help out my relationship at the time. And yeah, it just put me in a place that uh, was a spot I'd never been in before and kind of made me look at what I was doing and just had to start being smarter about what I was doing. So then it was back to working construction in the summertime to make money and get ready for the next winter. We start off the season and uh, end up breaking my ankle straight away and required surgery and it put me out for the whole season. It was a great year, lots of powder, people were bragging about how good it was all the time and I felt pretty alienated. If your sport is also a way to express yourself, then you have all that creative energy and you, you have like all these ideas and things you want to do that you see with your mind and your body is just like not functioning to make it happen. So you feel like you're, you feel like you're mute. It can really just make your mind bounce around in your head like a pinball, man. And it's hard not to get negative. You know, sports is obviously like a great outlet for frustration, for anything you need to deal with. And if you're trapped and you can't do sports, then all the other issues in your life are really going to be coming at you. You know, relationships suffer, your mental stability suffers. Everybody thinks like you're all, you're some star, but you feel like a loser. You got to put twice the effort in to get back to where you were and catch up for the things that you missed. It's pretty easy to uh, just start partying every night and uh, all of a sudden your health mentally and physically deteriorates and it's tough to come back from that. Some people get you know, taken out of the game uh, for good. The more you put into your career, if all your eggs are in the same basket, if you're hurt for a while and if you have like a big injury or a chronic injury, then you become really scared for your own security because next thing you know it's too late and now you're out. Everything that we were doing was just kind of blossoming and the X Games started. There was skier cross and like big air events and they started building parks at a lot of ski areas. If I would have missed a year before it probably wouldn't have been as big of a deal but that kind of put me two seasons back in a sense. It was tough to not be a part of it because I was just sitting on the sidelines watching it all happen. Tour Ronde is a peak that just kind of pops right out of the Valley Blanche. It rests right on the border of uh, Italy and France. It's a perfect peak, except that it's got a 70-meter uh, ice fall in the middle. 
everything was in our favor. It was stacked up. We, we had to sit out some hard snow. We, we've been unlucky with some conditions. The conditions got really, really good. The skiing's gonna be easy, but the new objective hazard is, hey, maybe this thing will just slough us off the mountain. So when we arrived there, we said, okay, let's let's just see how it goes. Let's let's start climbing up, you know, if, if things start getting hairy, if too much slough comes down, we'll turn around. If we were climbing on kind of powdery spines, the higher we got, the, the bigger the sloughs came. You know, I motioned to Seth, I'm like, hey, we, we better get on the far left side just because this, this slough gets any bigger, you know, it can take you off the face. As soon as Seth and I moved over to the left, a huge slough came down. And we actually got lucky that uh, Kai didn't get blown off the side of the mountain. You know, it was at that moment that we were like, okay, that's it. It's game over, you know, perfect conditions, powder skiing of a lifetime. It looked like a dream up there. And we had to walk away. It's crazy to be in a, in a spot like that, in a face like that, knowing that you got these ice axes and crampons and you can just go flying down the mountain with your backpack on all the way to the bottom and who knows what would happen to you. If we were there 20 minutes earlier, we might have gotten just ripped right off the ice. Then we're all roped up, we're attached, we would have been, it, it could have been really messy. It could have been really messy. Objective hazard is something that you don't have any control over. And Chamonix is full of those. Uh, you can do everything perfect here. Um, you know, you can be the best skier in the world. You can be the best alpinist. Despite all of that, there's so much potential for, for fatality because you can't know anything for certain here. You have, there's a certain gamble, there's a certain risk. Don't look behind. I guess you're looking behind. It's very steep and icy. I've had many friends here die on the easy parts, you know, it's like that's the most common way for the most famous alpinists or skiers to die. It's, it's not when they're doing the hard part and the engaged part, it's all the objective hazards that surround it. You thought the first thing was that he fell into the darkness 100 feet down, 200 feet down. To me, he was deep, he was gone. You don't even really want to run over and look over the edge to see what's below. And it's pretty much, to me, it's the worst nightmare. I've never been put to the test that way. So when stuff like that happens, it's heavy, you know, and it's like that. I definitely like uh, pictured the worst for half a second until he screamed that he was fine, you know. Back around. You all right, man? <laughs> I was reckless. You know, I put the whole rest of the guys in danger, I put myself in danger, and kind of took a risk that I probably shouldn't have, you know, for my own little enjoyment. I pretty much did everything wrong. You know, I wrapped the rope before this, I had the rope. You know, what would have happened if I really would have gone all the way down? So then those guys would have been stuck without a rope. You know, but stuff like that happens. It's, you know, none of us are perfect. Mistakes are made, uh, made all the time. And sometimes you come out lucky and sometimes you end up dead. It was on August 9th, I'll never forget it. And I came home and I had been backpacking. I got home and there was a message from Seth saying, oh, uh, I've been in a helicopter incident. It was so matter of fact, I, 
I didn't understand. It didn't even cross my mind that there was a crash. The morning of the helicopter incident is still very vivid in my mind. Uh, Seth was on the first load with my good friend, Greg Harms, who was one of my heli guides. It was a really clear day, almost no wind at all. And the landing was gonna be, it was gonna be just probably just over 13,000 feet. And we took off and we were just, you know, enjoying the scenery, saw the first run we were gonna do. Let the pilot do some orbits so we could feel out the wind direction. Seth was directly behind me. The pilot didn't like the landing so much or didn't like the wind and he was kind of talking to me over the headset about the wind and the wind, the direction wasn't right for him. Then he did like a 180 degree pedal turn, which is where you just rotate the helicopter. That type of move at the altitude we were at caused a loss of power, which is a loss of lift in the helicopter. I think when we realized that we were going to crash, uh, you know, it was more like we dropped out of the sky like a rock. And it was, it was something that you, you could, had no control over, you couldn't prepare for it. And pretty much, I just remember just closing my eyes and uh, you know, then the impact. I was in communication with the pilot. We're having a conversation as we're going down and he's doing everything, everything he can to recover the machine. And I know in my heart that uh, he fought it all the way until we impacted. And unfortunately, he died on impact. I, I was able to call Greg. He responded to me. I said, Harms, what do you got? He said, coffee. Uh, the pilot's dead. We have two trapped inside. Seth and I are outside. I have a broken back. Seth has a brain injury. We hit on the right side of the machine, on the pilot side. The machine was laying flat on that side. I just remember this more just because of the photo that was in the newspaper here that I have. Seth and uh, Greg were on the, the left-hand side of the ship, the non-impact side, and both, the, both those guys survived. It was just the, the luck of the day. Uh, it could have gone the other way for Seth and Greg. I never thought of where else he could have been in the helicopter. I just could not believe that he wasn't hurt more than he was. You really think about what you're getting into sometimes, and you think about the family aspect of it, your, your parents, and it's a tough one for, for the ones left behind, but there's nothing you can really do about it except continue to live your own life. It's pretty much being selfish, but that's kind of runs with the, the territory of being in this kind of situation where you're uh, just trying to stay alive. He has a drive. I don't know where it comes from. Maybe it does come from being, having a feeling of some kind of abandonment that he needs to get out and show people that he, you know, I, I but again, I don't think of him as being a showman. He's, this is all internal for him for what he does. Like I'm just always still looking for something else. It's never uh, good enough, whatever I'm doing. He is such a perfectionist. He's very intolerant of imperfection. I just don't want to settle for anything. And when, to me, I think when other people do, they're giving up. As far as the father end of it, maybe there was you know, confusion or, or disappointment, but uh, at a certain point in time, that was all f forgotten. It's really deep inside of him. He doesn't display any outward signs of it, but you can just tell that it has an effect on him. I feel for him because it's not something he wants to talk about. He just wants to put it behind him. The only way I can get the demons out of my head is to be involved in these kind of sports where I can focus on what I'm doing, living in the moment, and just get full release of the problems I have. Other people find other ways of doing it. You know, drugs, drinking, or other sports or, you know, who knows? Everybody's different, but being a skier, is, it's all I know. I, I wouldn't know what else to do. Years ago, I read a book, and let me see if I can remember the quote. There's a thin line between adventure and suicide. The finer the line, the greater the adventure. 
you know, I don't think what we're doing is stupid or crazy. I think it's it, there's risks involved, but I think we're uh, all at a certain level where we're, we can we can manage those risks. And part of the enjoyment is because it's dangerous, but um, you never want to have a friend die. And it seems lately it's been a lot of people having bad accidents. You really couldn't call it extreme unless the 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 risk would be you dying. You know, that's that's what that's what's the difference between these type of athletes is that's how far they're really actually hanging it out there. And that's what makes it really real. I have, you know, friends that grew up here that are a few years older than me that literally every single person that they loved is dead. Every single one of their friends from their crew is dead. I don't know if it's worth it, but it's it's a most one of the most beautiful places in the world to like to pass time to uh, to do a sport. Some people will see it as a conflict, but I see it as a partnership. It's like a, there's dangers and there's consequences, and it can kill you. But I still really don't see it as like this force against you. It's what makes us us. À l'heure actuelle, des gens qui sont passionnés et que oui, on... elle nous aime ou elle nous aime pas, mais il euh, y a des moments où euh, quand elle nous aime, c'est génial. It, it comes down to a choice, and if you're willing and if you want it, then you will take these risks. You have to accept the risk. Otherwise, you can't do this stuff. For me, skiing Chamonix is not so much about the adrenaline rush. It's about the concentration, going from turn to turn, purely focusing on trying not to fall. You know, that's the only time I find peace in my life right now is when I'm doing those kind of things because I, I got to deal with so much other bullshit all the time. Seth and the Guida Midi, you know, his first time up there, he couldn't even see the runs. I don't even think he wanted to look at them. The last thing he wanted to do was ski them. What's so unique is the fact that you can step right off the tram and open the gate, put your skis on, and go. And I've never had that kind of vertical off of a chairlift before. It takes a while before you're going to actually look at that face, look out those windows in that tram, and say, hey, look at that. There's a ski line there, and I can ski that. He kind of grabbed me and was like, I got my head around it. I'm ready. Let's go ski this thing. And I'll come down and pull. I mean, we'll see when we, when we get over there. But... Um, we brought in Dave Rosenberger, you know, who's a good friend, guy who spent a lot of time on all those runs underneath the Aguida Midi. The whole north face of that's either rock or black ice. It's just one or the other. It doesn't hold snow. It melts every summer, turns to black ice. So what you need is this special magic snow that comes usually with warm weather. And, and you just wait and wait and wait. And there's many years where you, you can never ski it. You know, the North Face is kind of exclusive, something that's just so wild and so dangerous. And it's just off the lift. We wanted to maybe ski it in the sun, but it, uh, we were worried about the clouds. We got there early. The sun wasn't going to happen. Clouds were coming, so we decided to go ahead and go in. Off the top, you had to repel in with your skis on. There's absolutely no way you could have made turns on the top where the wrap was. The snow wasn't completely covering the top ice pitch, so uh, we found a nice anchor, tied two 70-meter ropes together, and uh, pretty much sent Dave in first. Dave takes off, a little hesitant at first. Made a couple cautious turns. Snow was fantastic. Maybe like 8 to 12 inches of like blow or pow on top of black ice. And then he starts opening it up into some bigger turns. You're like, OK, hey, it looks good. Time to go. Kind of look over at Seth, and I can see that his hands are shaking. It was body numbing, just knowing where you're going and what, what's involved. And that's a good sign, because if you're not scared, you're a little dumb. He gets his skis on, throws a rope through his rappel device, gets in the fakie position, and heads off. Oh, there goes Seth. That's what we call living on the edge. Getting past your fear is the biggest part about being around this place. It's just you're so exposed the whole time. It's just there's no room for error.
Now we're about ready to rappel another 70 meters into a very narrow, very steep couloir. It's just a very dangerous spot to be. This is the point where you start to get really nervous. I'm in there with Dave and he's telling me about how it was in there last year. He almost got taken down by a huge slough that came off another wall. Just something naturally that happened. Just hearing about these tales of the danger around here. Hope nothing comes flying down right now because that's that's it, man. You're gonna go for a huge ride. You'll be able to see me just down there and right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, Dave's in the hole and ready, so uh, here we come, man. Welcome to Chamonix. Baby turn, baby. That's it, not now. This Chamonix's definitely given me the feeling of back to the roots skiing, the pure skiing. There's the line, you're going and skiing that, no matter what the conditions are, no matter what the light is, you're just going and doing it regardless of all the other things that you become accustomed to doing. It's like skiing before you ever were doing it in front of the camera. Yeah, the second time we went out to the Tour Ronde, and it snowed the night before, the day before it was bad weather, and there was no wind. It was a beautiful, beautiful starlit morning. You know, conditions were feeling good. We weren't having heavy wind. Uh, we had fresh snow. That should be nice, at least down here. The sun started hitting the top of the face, and we were starting to get a little bit of, uh, a little bit of slough, you know, enough to make everyone hesitate a little bit reminded me of the time before. And every time I was looking up there, I just kept seeing fluff coming down the, the channel again, and at the same time, just kind of wondering if it's gonna knock off any rocks. I wouldn't say the vibe was uh, skeptical, but uh, definitely cautious, and uh, everybody was paying attention and really alert. Last time we were here, there was about a meter fresh of snow, and the slough was really, really scary. And, you know, pretty much had to turn around before this ice pitch. And today we still had some slough, but you know, alas, able to work it. Oh, the stairway up here. We had the crux in the bag at that point. You know, that was our biggest objective hazard for the day, and we passed it. Dropping in on any sort of face like that where you do have a you know, huge cliff band or an ice band, you know, it's, it's really intimidating. Uh, plus, you also know that you're skiing soft snow, so you're gonna have slough. You know, it's really easy to get pushed off a face like that. You're actually kind of floating above this soft, moving surface. It's a really effortless, very special feeling, that type of snow. I started hooting, was like, you know, yelling up to the guys, oh, it's, it's, it's good. The snow is kind of creamy snow, but the slough that you created was pretty huge. If you had a problem, you would have just gone sliding right down that like you were at a water slide park. You wouldn't have stopped. If you fell at the top part, there's a good chance you're going to die, so you don't want to fall. Then we're watching JP. Slough was swirling around his face. Sometimes he was getting, even getting face shots. He pulls into the belay. We're there. We're good. We change back to crampons rappel down. As soon as everyone puts their skis on, tucks in behind the rock, we're out of the corridor of the ice. Everything's super relaxed. The angle of the run seems so much less after what you'd already been through. It was nice to be able to open up the turns and fly down it.
It might take weeks, it might take years. If you're patient enough and if you're persistent enough, eventually you'll accomplish your goals out here. That's fun. Scary as hell. When I leave Chamonix and I go skiing somewhere else, I look at everything completely differently now. Everything's so much easier than it was before. What do you figure about some of that stuff, maybe, Sam? Or you want to look for something better? Well, I used to do a lot of flying around. It's just like, you know, on the ground here. He's one of the most humble skiers to be out in the mountains with. And I think coming to Sham probably humbled him even more, but also made him more rowdy at the same time. Bottom line, in any sport, very few people make it. There's just so many factors that can take you down, that can bring you down. We celebrate the guys that have made it. They're a big deal. I think when people overcome a lot and, and persevere through a lot of struggles and they're still doing it, they get like this zen. It takes a good chunk of your entire life to figure that out. Once you do, it's like you're set forever, you know, you're, you're unstoppable. everything I had into skiing. That's all that mattered to me. I didn't care about what people were telling me. Lots of people are telling me I was doing the wrong thing, but you don't need everything to make sense and fall into line. Everything just automatically does. If you're doing something that you enjoy doing every day, it doesn't matter if you're living in a shoebox or if you're living in a mansion on the side of the ski resort. You wake up and you're gonna do everything you can do to just better your position for your skiing. And that's what it is, and that's what it comes down to. There's never about Becoming a professional skier, that's something that just came. You don't have to do what everyone else is doing. And, you know, if they're doing something that maybe you can't do, you can go out and do something different. And, you know, that's just as cool, if not cooler. I think a lot of people who, who stay in the game for a long period of time just have that mentality. They want to do something out of the norm to go against the grain of what everybody else is doing. If you're always capable of evolving, you'll always be looking towards the future. Things will always be getting better. That there should be a mother of extreme skier counseling group. <laughs> you know, I don't know, but I never, I never knew other mothers that had kids that were doing these things. I never dreamed he would go in a direction like this. You know, I'm a proud, terrified mother. If you love something enough, you'll find a way to do it, no matter what the consequences are or what it costs you. And that's how people get in these situations, taking chances.
Красота. helps you got to know how to get yourself in trouble too I mean that's basically the explanation of the kind of extreme skiing is putting yourself into really difficult situations for fun and then skiing out of it <laughs> Joey, I mean, yeah, he's he's definitely getting like he's he's what 41 now, 37. Yeah, he probably fucking punched me in the face. <laughs> I'm here driving snowcat at Ritalik, and I was driving Seth around the last seven days, and I uh, just thought I'd write a final poem for the film. Here we go. Another tour ends with Seth and the cat. Seth's in first again, how about that? Filmers, photographers, and all the guides load up and get in and settle inside. Thinking back of trips with Seth in the past, making more memories to last. Strong individual, one of a kind, talent and humility, a rare combination to find. Living on his own terms, not always an option. Sacrifice and challenge pursue. A pure love for skiing and constant believing will always see him through. Life is simple. Seth follows his passion. When you dedicate yourself, great things will happen. At the end of the day, if he looks in the mirror, a reflection of the ordinary skier.